This video was sponsored by Skillshare. In this week's flyover, legs for the orbital launch mount at Pad 39A begin going up, foundations for the Mega Bay at Roberts Road are completed, and Blue Origin continues with expansions of their campus. I'm Ian Atkinson with NASA Spaceflight, taking you on an aerial tour of the recent progress around Kennedy Space Center. Let's start off with SpaceX's Roberts Road complex at Kennedy Space Center. On the east end, as always, we have Hangar X. This facility is used to refurbish Falcon 9 boosters, as well as fairing halves. By its main entrance lies the empty Falcon 9 booster transporter parked to one side, waiting for yet another booster to be loaded onto it and moved to either of SpaceX's launch pads at the Cape. This is quite common these days, as SpaceX is ramping up its launch cadence. To the north end of Hangar X, we can see that an area has been cleared for what appears to be upcoming parking space. Moving from here to the west, we have the Starship Launch Tower assembly area. This is where pieces for the Starship Launch Tower are being assembled in segments before later being transported to the launch site for stacking in the near future. Counted in order of construction, the fifth and sixth segments are now structurally complete compared to our last flyover. All columns and cross beams have been installed in them. Additionally, the fifth segment can be seen sporting a new floor to facilitate worker access to that particular level once the segments are stacked at the 39A launch tower area. Feet stands for the seventh segment are already in place, with a column getting ready for lifting and installation, and several cross beams staged nearby. Also in this area, we can see the feet stands for the eighth and ninth segments. One set is next to the third tower segment, and the other set is near the water tank. It is believed that these two will be the last segments to be built, based on the available concrete stands for the tower segments. Moving a bit south from here, we can see that the tent area has seen the arrival of several cryogenic pipes, and work is already ongoing to prepare them for installation on the tower segments. SpaceX is most likely going to outfit the tower segments with these pipes while at Roberts Road, to reduce the amount of work needed to be executed on the launch tower once it's stacked. Having to install large pieces of hardware, like these pipes, onto the assembled tower is time-consuming and requires tall cranes. And last but not least, it now appears that these tower segments have been identified with numbers, but they don't match the order they were built in. It wouldn't be surprising if these numbers end up being their stacking order. Moving to the south from here, we can see that the Mega Bay foundations are now complete, with rebar sticking out of the ground. The pile driller has also been moved away from this area, which is a great sign that work on the foundations has ended. We can't really say the same about the Star Factory building, however, as work is still ongoing on its foundations. The pace of work in this area is slower than previously expected, given the agility the SpaceX teams had at the beginning of this building's construction. But good news for those who like cleaning though, SpaceX has finally removed the burning pile of wood they've had here for the past several months. These were trees and bushes that were cleared from the construction area. Some concrete has also been laid out nearby. It's still unclear why, but we'll be keeping an eye out as to what happens here. Next, we'll discuss progress on the Starship pad at 39A, but first, thanks to Skillshare for making this video possible. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes and members across the globe. If you have a specific skill you want to learn, Skillshare is a great place to start. I personally was interested in their culinary classes. I love cooking and baking, and there is such a wide variety of courses available for any type of chef or baker. One of my favorites was Think Like a Chef by Kenny Monroe and Christian Perkins, where they teach you the patterns of cooking with little tips and tricks along the way. In the course, they go over knife usage, what types of cookware you actually need, preparing a few dishes without exact recipes, and presentation. I think one of the most helpful things I learned from the course is that the food is done when it's done. You don't need to follow a specific timer. I think this course has helped me to not only see the ingredients in a new light, but also how to be a safer chef. Head over to Skillshare today, the first 1,000 people to use the link below, or our code NASA Spaceflight0522, will get a one month free trial. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. SpaceX has started installation of the legs for the orbital launch mount, with three already visible in this flyover. It is notable that these legs don't sport any elbow structures like the ones do at Starbase. It is yet to be seen whether they'll be added at a later time or if this launch mount design already takes into consideration the absence of these elbows. 
The base of the Starship launch tower remains visibly unchanged. It is likely that teams are waiting for the concrete to cure before pouring the next section. It is also to be expected that minor work is still ongoing on the interior areas of the base. On the main ramp of Pad 39A, we can see the Transporter Erector, or TE, used for Falcon rockets, now having its top section in Dragon configuration. The TE uses two different top sections depending on whether they're performing a mission with a Dragon or a fairing on top of the rocket. This work was needed to take place in preparation for the CRS-25 mission currently scheduled for liftoff in about two weeks. Just west of Pad 39A is NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building. This massive facility was used to assemble the mighty Saturn V and Space Shuttle rockets. Currently, it's used to put together NASA's Mega Moon rocket, the Space Launch System, which will carry humans back to the moon for the first time since 1972 as part of the Artemis program. Various components of the SLS are delivered to this massive facility, where they are stacked atop the mobile launcher before rolling out to Pad 39B. Soon, we'll see the SLS roll out again to this pad to complete the wet dress rehearsal test, which the team wasn't able to complete due to a failure of a helium check valve on the rocket's second stage and a hydrogen leak at the tail surface mast umbilical. The wet dress rehearsal is crucial to test the fueling and countdown procedures and to make sure that the rocket and ground support equipment is all good to go for an orbital launch. Just beside the vehicle assembly building is Boeing's Commercial Crew and Cargo Processing Facility, or C-3PF for short. This former shuttle processing hangar was used by NASA for extensive preps and refurbishment of the space shuttles before Boeing converted it to manufacture, process, and refurbish its Starliner spacecraft. A Starliner capsule is currently docked to the ISS as part of Orbital Flight Test 2. And once it returns back to Earth, the spacecraft will be refurbished in this facility before flying another mission, likely the first operational crew rotation. Next, we'll discuss progress at Blue Origin and at SpaceX's fleet. Over at Blue Origin's complex, the two-cat structure is the main focus of progress. The cladding on the roof is completely done, and the side buildings got more and more covered as well. In addition, the staircase seems to be fully assembled. What also changed a lot since last week is the frame in front of the two-cat that seems to be related to a door for the facility, or perhaps just external bracing. If it is a door, it may be used to seal the building in the future when it hosts the precious new Glen's second stages. Also at Blue Origin, we saw a wrapped dome structure in front of the rocket factory. While this is of course speculation, it seems to be in a range of about 7 to 8 meters in diameter, based on very rough guesstimations. If only there was a rocket that had a diameter of about 7 meters that could be built here. Hmm. Anyway, the warehouse expansion at the southern end of the campus is slowly progressing as well. Since our last flyover, Blue has submitted updated plans that no longer show a building in the center of this area. Now, they plan to build a maintenance support facility and extra storage areas just to the west of there. Over at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex is the Rocket Garden, which houses various old rockets on display. Beside it is the complex's newest attraction, the Gateway Building, which will be opening soon. Inside it is a flight-proven Falcon Heavy side booster, B-1023, suspended from the ceiling, which supported two orbital launches before moving into the new building. Once it opens, people will be able to get up close and personal with the sooty first stage of America's workhorse rocket. Nearby, we spotted a pair of Space Shuttle Era Tail Service Masts, or TSMs. These were used to fuel the shuttle on the pad, as well as maintain data and electrical connections. It is believed that these two are from Mobile Launch Platform 2. At the launch and landing facility, we spotted some construction work taking place at a patch of land just beside the runway. This is the first stage of Space Florida's development to attract even more industry to the area. The first phase of this expansion will have over 400 acres of usable land and, according to Space Florida, potential uses for this site include operational hangars, office space, aerospace manufacturing, and more. Over at Air Liquide, things still look unchanged since our last flyover. It's unclear if the upgrades needed for SLS have been implemented or not, since the appearance of the facility hasn't changed a bit. At Port Canaveral, Booster 1052-5 sits atop a shortfall of gravitas, 
after having arrived hours earlier at the dock. The booster and drone ship were part of SpaceX's Starlink Group 4-18 mission that launched just last week from Pad 39A. The tug in charge of bringing the drone ship back to port was none other than SpaceX's multi-purpose recovery vessel, Doug. This vehicle helps SpaceX's recovery crews quickly approach the booster once it's safed on top of the drone ship. It is capable of scooping Falcon 9 fairing halves out of the ocean. These days, recovering intact fairing halves from the ocean is routine, and we can see here that Doug indeed came back with both fairing halves from the mission without any visible damage. And that's it for today's flyover. Be sure to check out our daily videos of Starbase in Boca Chica as well, to stay up to date on everything SpaceX and Starship. Finally, thanks to all our members who make videos like this possible. See you all in the next flyover.